So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Coimbra Group uh, YouTube channel. I'm Ludovic Tilly, uh, and I'm uh, the chair of the Coimbra Group Executive Board. And I would like to welcome you today to a very special event that we are organizing. Uh, this is uh, the uh, first ever online uh, 3MT Coimbra Group final uh, that we are organizing today. Uh, this is actually the fourth uh, time that we organize such final, but the first three uh, finals were uh, live uh, in physical uh, meeting during the, our annual uh, meetings. And because of this very uh, special uh, context uh, related to the COVID-19, we were obliged to transfer uh, this final to an online uh, meeting. Uh, I, this will be a very challenging uh, session, so we, we hope uh, that you will uh, appreciate all the, 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 the sequences of today. Uh, today we are um, uh, celebrating some of the Coimbra Group very important uh, uh, values uh, in particular, uh, the uh, research of professional development and cross-country mobility. Uh, the Coimbra Group is a network of 41 uh, research-led and education-led universities in Europe from 23 countries. And as I said, this is the first uh, online final uh, for the three minute thesis competition. Uh, today, we will have a very, uh, very interesting agenda. We will have uh, the, the three uh, finalists who will present their uh, pitches. And because of this online um, structure, we decided to also invite uh, representatives from the European Commission to discuss with us on a new initiative which will strengthen uh, the researchers' mobility opportunities in the framework of the recently adopted communication on a new European research area for research and innovation. And a bit later uh, this morning, we will have the pleasure to receive uh, Anna Panagopoulou, who is the director of the Common Implementation Center and acting director for research and innovation outreach at the direct, uh, Directorate General for Research and Innovation at the Commission. We will also, after the final, uh, we will also conclude this uh, morning with the award ceremony for the 2020 Arenberg Coimbra Group Prize uh, that is celebrating uh, the added value of Erasmus uh, exchanges at the level of master's degree uh, and the students uh, who have performed such mobility are uh, the candidates to uh, this ceremony. Uh, this is a very, as I was saying, this is a very challenging uh, uh, session uh, to, to run uh, such a live streaming thesis in a virtual format. Uh, and uh, this, uh, we would like to, to, to thank the University of Granada that has been very helpful uh, thanks to uh, the technical support that they are providing. This is how they also perform their own 3MP competition. And uh, we uh, are using their expertise and we would like to warmly thank them. I also thank the audience to, uh, to be here with us. You can use Twitter and the YouTube chat to raise questions and comments, in particular when we will discuss with Anna Panagopoulou a bit later on. So without waiting, I would like to give the floor to Gunda Uskobla, who's the chair of the Doctoral Studies Working Group. She will introduce the 3MT competition. Gunda, uh, I hand it over to you. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you on behalf of the Working Group on Doctoral Studies. As Ludovic said, this is actually our first live final of the Coimbra Group uh, three minute thesis competition, which is held online with all the unique challenges and the unique chances it offers. I uh, think one of the main chances is that we can reach much larger audience, that people can participate and uh, support also our competitors, may it be colleagues, friends, family, supervisors. So this is one of the chances and um, I, I think that is also quite a great opportunity and it's not just a second best. The whole competition is about science communication and that science communication is important. I, we have seen also during the past months of crisis, 
I guess everyone saw that it's very important for fighting the pandemic to have research and innovation, but it also needs, needs researchers who can talk about their findings to a public. And it's also very important for our universities to train already early stage researchers that they know how to talk about their research to a non-specialist audience. One of these initiatives is the uh, three-minute thesis competition. And um, I will now share my screen with you for a few facts on the three-minute thesis uh, competition. It was actually developed originally in Australia at the University of Queensland. And um, it spread around the world rather quickly. The competition consists of effectively explaining one's research in three minutes only and with only one slide and it is addressing a non-specialist audience. The Coimbra Group Network implemented the competition in 2017 upon an initiative of the Doctoral Studies Working Group, which was really in line with our strategic priorities because we wanted to work on professional development of PhD candidates. Within the Coimbra Group Network, we have two phases of this competition. During the first phase, the universities, the member universities run their own finals of the competition and uh, they record the competition and then send in the video of the winner to the Coimbra Group office. We then launch an online voting procedure in which um, the universities assign points to the preferred candidates and the top three of them are shortlisted and have the opportunity to participate in the finals of the Coimbra group. The live finals are usually taking place um, during the Coimbra group annual conference. We meant already to have this finals at the beginning of June at the University of Montpellier. Then we had to postpone it and uh, now we have it online today. Uh, this year, 19 universities participated in the competition out of the 41 member universities, um, and they sent in this video. Uh, this is quite amazing because not only we had to adapt to an online format, but some of our member universities uh, hadn't run their finals when the lockdown hit the universities. Despite the emergency mode, many of them um, transferred the competition to an online competition. That's, that is amazing that universities keep up these activities, that the doctoral researchers participate in these activities, um, and it shows how important it is to all of us. So we really acknowledge this, and that's why it was not a hard decision for the working group to decide that we want to do these finals no matter how and where and in which context. One of the universities, as Ludwig already said, that uh, had already transferred was the University of Granada. We, really, we are really thankful for your technical support today, that you are the team behind the scenes, that are you are professionally taking care of us. Um, I will now shortly introduce to you the rules of the competition, which is um, one single static slide, no transitions, no props, no rhymes, no things, no nothing really which, which, uh, which is more than talking about your topic. Um, worth mentioning is that there, uh, an online competition needs a few further explanations. The presentations are limited to three minutes maximum and competitors exceeding these three, three minutes are disqualified. This shows that it's quite crucial to have a good timer the timer that you see on YouTube is rather an indication though, because there may be a few seconds of technical delay due to the live streaming. And therefore we decided that the timer that officially counts is the one which the competitors have with them while presenting. All of our competitors are at the premises of their home universities. They have a local team that supports them, that is behind the camera. And they also um, take care that there is a good technical running and that they have an exact timer for the 180 seconds or three minutes that you have for presenting your, for, uh, your subject. 
presentations are to commence from the stage. Well, that's also difficult today. We agreed on a starting signal, and once the starting signal is on, they have two seconds to turn on their mics and then start with the presentation. So there are a lot of new people watching you, and five people are watching very closely. This is um, today's jury, that because we have a judging panel that has to come up with a difficult decision on who is the winner of the winners. The judging panel consists of five people from Coimbra Group Universities. Um, it's a gender balanced and also a um, jury, and also a jury with people from all kinds of academic backgrounds. We have Professor Claudia Cavadas from the Executive Board. She is Vice Rector for Research at the University of Gran uh, Coimbra, and her background is in pharmacology. Then we have Professor Pedro Garcia Sanchez from the University of Granada. He is a professor for mathematics, and he's also a member of our working group on doctoral studies. The third person on the jury is Jean-Marie Pansman. He is the head of the International Office at the University of Poitiers, and he is the vice chair of the doctoral studies working group. His background is in humanities and social sciences. The fourth person on the jury is Professor Rita Pickel. She is the Emerita Vice Rector of the University of Turku, and she is actually a science communication expert and will be the spokesperson of today's jury. Last but not least, we have Professor Adriana Seid. She is a professor of economics at the University of Yash, and she's also a member of the doctoral studies working group. Thanks a lot for accepting to be on the jury. Uh, we trust that you will uh, take a careful decision and um, they all have to keep in mind the judging criteria of this competition. And I'd also like to uh, bring them to the, to the awareness of the, the audience uh, that is following the YouTube channel so you, you can make up your own mind and try to come up with your own decision. It's two categories of criteria. One is on comprehension and content. Um, for example, you can ask yourself, uh, was the thesis topic, the research significant, the results, impact, and outcomes communicated in a language appropriate to a non-specialist audience? I think this captures it all. Um, please ask yourself this question. The other category is on engagement and communication. So did the oration actually make you want to know more? Is a presenter careful not to trivialize or generalize research? Is there enthusiasm for the research? And did the, power, the slide enhance the presentation? All these are questions that you can keep in mind to judge on who is, which presentation is actually best. Enough of the preliminaries. Um, we have to start now. Um, the sequence of the presentations was actually drawn by Lot. And our first competitor in the three-minute thesis final of the Coimbra group is Vicente Artola Arita. He is originally from El Salvador in Central America, where he also did his undergrad studies in the field of medicine. Today, he is in his second year of his PhD at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And his thesis is actually on personalized approaches toward towards aerial fibrillation. Today, he presents us his research topic in a presentation with a title, One Size Does Not Fit Our Hearts. Vicente, please get ready for your presentation. Ready, set, and go. Today, I'm going to the doctors. I have the most common heart arrhythmia in my heart. And uh, that one in four people in the world will suffer, or probably more, because we are living longer, because doctors are more aware of it. And this time, I will insist the doctor again that this medicine does not make me feel better. And he will probably insist again that research shown that this is the best medicine on average. On average. On average means that in these studies, this medicine was good for most of the people. But what if, what if I, or you, or maybe you are not part of those, most of the people. In the clinics, right now we see that patients with the same heart problem, they have different symptoms. And even with the same symptom, they can have different problems. So this gives us three fundamental problems. We cannot recognize who has one heart problem or the other. Poor diagnosis. We have another problem. 
We don't know what's happening in our body and we cannot give them appropriate counseling to these patients. So we have poor prevention. And third, we don't know who responds better to one treatment or the other. So we have poor management of personalized medicine. In my thesis, I intend to tackle these three problems with the use of biomarkers. Biomarkers are these substances that are in your body, that are in your blood, and they interact with each other, making a representation of what's going on in your body, even when it's not evident. And we can just identify them with two, three drops of blood with the, at a regular doctor's checkup. And it's like when you see two or three friends together and you are suspicious of, oh, these two or three friends are into something. So far in our research, we have seen that men and women with the same heart problem, they have different biomarkers. So different conditions in the body. So probably different approaches. So in consequence, with the use of these biomarkers, I intend to identify people who really have one problem from the other. So that's the first problem, improved diagnosis. We can identify also the people that are having one condition different from the other. So we can give a better counseling. So that gives us better prevention. And third, we can identify, hopefully, people who can benefit from one treatment from the other. So better personalized medicine. So the next time that I go to the doctors, I really expect that he tells me, not that he has the best medicine, but the best medicine for me or maybe for you. Because just one size, just one size does not fit all our hearts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vicente. Well, we are now missing the applause. We are now missing the excitement of the audience, but I can tell you all of us here in the room, and I think also those who are watching, they are really with you and they are as excited as they would be when we are in one room. Um, let us immediately move on to our second competitor. Our second competitor in the three minute thesis final of the Coimbra group is Selena Bruns. Selena did her undergrad studies at the University of Cologne, which actually is also a member of the Coimbra group. And since 2018, she is now pursuing her PhD at the University of Göttingen in Germany. She is doing research in the field of agricultural economics and rural development with a focus on the larger Mekong region in Cambodia. Today, she presents us a topic of a thesis in a presentation with a title, Sustainable Economic Development of Smallholder Farmers in the Larger Mekong Region. So, Selina, please get ready for your presentation. It's ready, set, and go. I bet you all remember this. It's my favorite childhood game, Where's Waldo? For those of you who don't know it, don't worry, I'll give you a quick briefing. You get a picture of a huge crowd, and the goal is to find Waldo, the gentleman with the red and white striped t-shirt, the fancy hat, and of course, his glasses. Now, have you ever noticed that no matter which of these pictures you're looking at, it is only Waldo, among all these people, who is wearing glasses? Yes, some might be wearing sunglasses, but it is only Waldo who has proper glasses. And that's a really puzzling proportion, don't you think? Because sometimes Waldo is the only one among maybe 1,000 others with glasses. Now that's the same puzzling proportion we found when visiting smallholder farmers in rural Cambodia. No one was wearing glasses and to find someone, really anyone who did, you had to search very, very hard. Now these farmers in Cambodia, they live in poverty and in my PhD, I tried to contribute in understanding why some appear to be stuck in poverty, and others, facing seemingly equal circumstances, manage to escape poverty. So we decided to take a closer look at this puzzling proportion. We scanned through literature, couldn't really find anything, and so we conducted an eyesight test with 300 smallholder farmers. Here comes the interesting thing. Out of 300, 120 could not see properly, and yet no one, no one had glasses. When I think of you, yes you, behind the screen right now, chances are high you're wearing glasses, or at least somebody you know of. And I wonder, how would your life look like if you had to take them off for just one day? Could you do the daily things you're doing right now? Could you use your potential in the same way you're using it right now? I doubt it. And that's exactly what we found with respect to our sample. Those farmers who cannot see properly, and I remind you that's roughly half of our sample, 
make on average 200 US dollars less per year compared to their peers with good vision. 200 US dollars, that is almost one fifth of an average yearly income in Cambodia. That is 200 US dollars less to buy food, to not starve. So what I learned with respect to poverty is this. If only these farmers, and maybe many, many more smallholder farmers around the globe had access to glasses, their lives could change for the better. And what I learned for me personally is this. Sometimes the most interesting things come from not looking at what is there, but from looking at what is not there. Just as looking at the f is wearing glasses. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. That was another fantastic contribution and gives us more insights into research that is done by doctor researchers at all of our universities. I think it's always an amazing showcase to also see what research is done by early stage researchers. So you are also representative for all of the others who are doing that uh, research work at, at our universities. We are now about to listen to our final competitor in this, uh, in this year's final of the Coimba group of the Three Minute Thesis competition. Our third competitor is Maria Francesca Di Filippo. She is from Italy, where she did her undergraduate studies and also her PhD at the University of Bologna. She is a PhD candidate in biomimetic and material chemistry and is about to start with her third year of her PhD in November. She will now present us her research topic in a presentation with a title, Functional Properties of Shitosan Films Modified by Snail Mucus Extract. Maria, please get ready for your presentation. It's ready, set, and go. In the future, our time might be defined by our use of plastics. For this reason, in my project, I focus on the research of a new biodegradable and sustainable material able to replace the plastic films that are currently on the market. In fact, today, imagining a world without plastic seems impossible, but actually, their large-scale production and their widespread use occurred only from the end of World War II. Just think that, and this is the most eye-popping statistics, the world has made as much plastics in the past 15 years he did in the previous half century. And the 50% of all plastics is used only once. And why is this a problem? Plastics are derived from oil and they are very hardly biodegradable material. But you know, we have a plastic island reminding us of that every day. The research is moving towards the search of bioplastics instead which are biodegradable materials called biopolymers that derive from renewable sources. However, this is very challenging and the progresses at the industrial level are very slow because the production costs are very high, but also because their properties are still not enough competitive with those of plastics. In my project, I use chitosan as biopolymer, since it is the second most abundant one on earth after cellulose and because it is derived from shrimp and crab shell so that we can give new life to the food industry waste. A strategy to improve the properties of bioplastic and making them more competitive for replacing plastics is to introduce in their composition some natural extract. And I combined chitosan with snail slime. Snail slime is a natural extract that was already employed in the ancient Greece since it is emollient, moisturizing, antibacterial, adhesive, protective and today is also an ingredient of several cosmetic and parapharmaceutical products. I spent quite a lot of time trying to find a good recipe, but at the end, I obtained a 100% natural based and biodegradable film that actually showed very good properties. And in addition, it preserved some of the peculiar properties of the snail slime, being antibacterial and adhesive. These properties make this film very interesting and versatile material so that we patented this formulation. And I'm sure that they are very suitable candidates for replacing plastics, not only in the food packaging applications, but also in the cosmetic and in the parapharmaceutical sectors. Thank you all. Thank you, Maria. Um, 
congratulations to all of you for your wonderful presentation. There are also quite a number of uh, support messages in the chat on the YouTube channel. So it's uh, really, uh, we, we are all app applauding and giving you applause for, for your performances. We have now seen all of the three minute pitches for today. A big thank, to, thank you to all of you. You are already all winners. It's now, well, a very hard decision to come up with who is actually the winner and who are the runners up. Fortunately, we don't have to make this decision, but it is the job of the jury. The jury is now uh, taking some time for deliberating. They have a 20 minute break to deliberate on coming up with the results and talking about the criteria. Meanwhile, we will proceed in the program and I'd like to give the floor to Ludovic Tilly, who will introduce the next topic on our agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gunda. I would like briefly to congratulate the three finalists. You have done an amazing job. I wouldn't like to be among the jury because that will, that will going to be, a, it's going to be a very, very hard task to decide who is the, the winner. You, to my heart, you are three winners, really. Congratulations. So without waiting, I would like to now uh, introduce Anna Panagopoulou, who is the director of the Common Implementation Center an acting director for research innovation outreach at the Directorate General for Research and Innovation uh, at the, the European Commission. Uh, as you know, today in the audience, we, we have uh, uh, different uh, profiles. We have early stage researchers, we have uh, senior researchers, and we are all interested in finding out more about uh, what uh, the Commission is preparing to really boost the human capital in research and in particular about the era for you initiative that where there are a very interesting uh, initiative for the early state researchers so anna please uh, i hand it over to you good morning to very to everybody many thanks ludovic uh, many thanks kuda and congratulations for organizing this event i know it's very challenging uh, if i remember the organization of the rni days that digital research and innovation organized very recently it was a big uh, challenge, but we managed, and I'm sure today you will have a very successful event. I would like also to take the opportunity to congratulate the three finalists. And uh, I say that from the bottom of my heart, because being able to communicate about science is, is a very important aspect. And it's something that in the, the context of the European Commission policy development, in the context of European research area, but also in the context of Horizon Europe program, it has become one of the highest priorities and it has become one of the, the most important aspects that we have to tackle in the years to come. Because after all, whatever you do, the researchers, the junior researchers, the senior researchers, the European universities, is it makes it matters for the society and will even matter more for the society if your results will be able to be communicated, will be designed at the very beginning with the involvement of the citizens and whether your results will be, be taken up at the market, it will be something very important that uh, will boost our economy and will give us opportunities for career development to all the researchers across Europe. And of course, to bring back talents that they left Europe already. So very well done. I'm looking forward to see the outcome of uh, the, the jury because it's very interesting. All the three of you, you were excellent. I'm very happy also to be with you today at the moment that important developments have been taking place in the context of the European Commission in close collaboration with all the member states and stakeholders. We have discussed with Ludovic in the past while we were designing and preparing the new communication on the European research area. But maybe before I explain the, the communication where I have some slides with the organizers, they will show to you. I, I would like to take a few minutes to, to check with you uh, whether you understand what is the European research area, where you know what is the European research area. I'm sure that all of you know about the framework program, you know about Horizon 2020, and you know about Horizon Europe. So our funding instruments, which is going really to provide the opportunity for more research and synergies across Europe. But probably you are not aware of what is ERA. So ERA was established 20 years ago, as I would say the single market for researchers and for the research as an area where it will give us the opportunity to work together with the member states, with the commission, uh, with uh, the stakeholders and organization on uh, bringing investments to join projects, 
but also on working together on policy aspects that are cross-cutting aspects across research and innovations, such as the career of researchers, uh, such as the mobility of researchers, the, the open access, open science, ethics, all the aspects that I would say that they are defining uh, the backbone of research and innovation systems, the stakeholders, the researchers, the principles under which research and innovation will be implemented, as well as the priorities. If you go to the next slide, in this context, uh, we have been very proud and very happy to see a lot of important developments in the context of the European research area. First of all, we are talking about 37 research infrastructures that have been implemented in close collaboration with the member states, when with the pooling investments between the European uh, Commission in the context of this his framework program and the member states investments of 20 billion euros. I have to highlight uh, there are plenty of infrastructure across Europe. Those that you have been uh, involved uh, in uh, uh, in working in infrastructures, you know very well how important research infrastructures are also for uh, the career opportunity, mobility of researchers, and for providing access to the researchers to do the actual research. Then the another, uh, another very positive experience and result that we had through the 20 years of European research area was how to bring uh, funding from the member states and European Commission on joint programs. And we're talking, um, we are happy to see about 7 billion euros that have been pulled up on joint programs. And this is very important because just Horizon Europe program cannot bring the change that we want, cannot bring the results that we want in relation to research and innovation. I think you all are aware, and I hope you're aware about the opportunities that they are given through the Euro Access Network and as well as the Charter and Code for Researchers, which has been established over the years as the main instrument and element which explaining how we could develop, develop the work of the researchers across the, in, the, in the European Union. And finally, open science and the open science cloud. I would like just to highlight here this is very much one of the issues that we are going to address in the next years, not just as a, in the context of having a repository for data and results that will be interoperable and openly accessed and reused by the researchers, but also as one of the main skills and capacities that the researchers they will have to develop in order to reform their careers and in order to be able to address and to be competitive in the, in, the, in the current period where openness, sharing data and having access to data is one of the most important aspects. You know very well that during, and as a good ascent, the crisis of COVID-19, uh, the work that research and innovation put in place, uh, the funding, the, the work of the researchers has been extremely important. But of course, all this work and the results and the data needs to be pulled together, together with data that are coming from clinical trials, data that are coming, epidemiological data that will come together and would be freely accessed to everybody who would like to continue this work. Otherwise, it will not be, have the impact that we expect uh, to have for the society and for bringing the resources that we need in order to overcome the COVID-19 crisis. Therefore, a concrete example of the open science cloud that we have delivered to the Commission is a COVID-19 platform. It's a platform where everybody can have access and can see the data that we collect uh, through the member states across Europe and research organizations and research infrastructures in relation to COVID-19 research uh, that is currently taking place. This is what we have, what we don't have, what are the gaps and why after 20 years of having ERA, we felt it is important from the Commission side to come with a new policy to be further engaged together with the member states, stakeholders and researchers in order to promote more and to open more the single market and to make it more efficient. First of all, and I believe all of you, you know that and you see the impact of that, public investments and private investments on research and innovation are not enough. We have put a target of 3% of uh, R&D investment coming from both public and private sector. And we are, very, we are not yet there. Actually, the average is much lower than the 3%. 
And in some countries, it's even lower, which means that whatever the research and innovation program of the European Union does, it's not enough. We need more investments on research and development from member states, from private sector, in order to be able to give opportunities for more research in Europe. Second, it is very clear that the divide on the r &I performance between the different member states is still there. What we can do through this new policy, what we can do through the collaboration and the reforms in the member states in order to upgrade the excellence across Europe and make all European research and innovation systems competitive and able to deliver what is expected from research and innovation. What we can do in order to bring the results more to policy, but also to the market. We do a lot of fantastic work. We have a lot of very nice publications, but what about the results? Do we use them? Do we bring them to the society? I heard a very nice example about uh, uh, what uh, we can do if we would have uh, glasses uh, for the people in Africa. Can we do something to bring these results to the policymakers so they will have an impact? What we can do with the technological developments to bring them and take them up by the industry in order to be able to boost the economic development and the transition of Europe. Gender equality, I'm happy to see in the three finalists that we have two women and one man. That doesn't mean necessarily that it's balanced, it's not balanced, but if you think that only 24% of top positions in research are occupied by female, so I think gender balance is one of the priorities that we need to address, and there is a need a lot of work still to be done. And finally, I already said uh, how we can bring citizens and society closer to what we do. And they do need to understand research. They do need to trust research. They do need uh, to, to look forward to our results for their well-being and for the development of their daily life. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, I would like to highlight here the two main novelties or two main axes under which we have developed the European research area. The first part is linked to deliver the transition and the recovery of Europe. So we strongly believe, and the European Commission strongly believes that through spending on research and innovation, through using the new, the next generation package that the, uh, the member states will have in their uh, availability for research and innovation, it will be able to promote the recovery of Europe it will be able to finance or research and innovation to promote a Green Deal, to try to reach the target that we have put in our policy documents. 35% of, spend, of uh, spending under Horizon Europe will be for the climate change, can actually do the same in the context of our collaboration with the member states. And also, we have a very challenging target of 55% uh, of reduction of emissions. This is what our president announced in her speech. Can we try through research and innovation to reach this very uh, challenging target? How we can do it? And also, we are talking about new technologies. We are talking about uh, the technological uh, sovereignty of Europe and the strategic autonomy of Europe in areas like 5G, in areas like uh, cybersecurity, space, artificial intelligence, and mobility. What we can do more in a new reality where digital transition and digital uh, sovereignty, it becomes even more and more important and how research and innovation could contribute to that. This is the novelty in the new European research area. So streamlining priorities and investments in order to deliver the transition and to recover Europe. And if we go to the next slide, this novelty will only happen if we are able to enforce, reinforce, and upgrade our research and innovation system overall. And in this research and innovation system, first but not least is the career of researchers. What we can do to improve the opportunities for researchers' careers so that we can attract young people to these careers. And when we speak about research and careers, and as you will see later on in my presentation, we don't speak only research and careers in the, in the academic context, 
but we see it also in the synergies between academia and business. What we can do more to attract researchers in Europe and to promote the mobility across Europe and beyond, but we need to keep the talent in Europe so that we do the brilliant research that we have just heard today. And then what is the ecosystem in which these researchers will be able to develop the talents and to have an excellent career. The innovation ecosystem, an ecosystem where we reinforce the collaboration between academia and industry, where research infrastructures as a big actors where the researchers can have a career are there. So this is the backbone of research and innovation system. And what we aim with this new policy is to improve it to make it more excellent and to prepare it in order to be able to deliver to the policy challenges of the European Union. In the next slide, you can see in a snapshot the structure of the communication and what we would like to achieve. I don't want to go into detail in that because maybe it's not interesting on, you are not interested on everything. I would like just to highlight that the communication is established around four main objectives. So prioritize investments, improving access to excellence for those countries that they are behind in their performance of the research and innovation system, translating the results into economic value and deepening era, which means how we can promote what we have already in place, better career for researchers, more open access, more open science, uh, more opportunities for uh, gender careers, uh, for a gender balance, and more opportunities for establishing a robust career framework through uh, different measures that we would like to put in place. I would like to highlight here that although it looks at the very first outset that very much this agenda is economic driven and uh, industrial driven, in practice, the role of research and innovation and the researchers per se it is one priority across all the sectors because only through prioritizing investments and more investments in research and innovation, it would be possible to give job opportunities and career opportunities to the researchers as well. So there are a lot of targets where we'll try to, to put in place to mobilize more investments on research and innovation. I would like indicatively to say that, for example, we hope that the member states they will be able to redeploy existing investments on joint activities and to increase this by 5%. And also, for example, that we would like that collectively the member states, they will be able to reinforce their investments on research and innovation and to reach an average of 1.25% collectively. Finally, we are going to, we hope that we will be able to deliver these results through a very robust governance. And the governance has two aspects. One is the establishment of the ERA Forum for Transition that is going to reinforce the collaboration of the member states and monitoring the implementation of uh, all the actions, activities that are established through the communication. And we have already established a roadmap of 14 actions to be implemented in the next years. And of course, this roadmap will be the basis for a policy agenda to be agreed with the member states. In this governance, we'll also follow very uh, closely what is the situation with the careers of researchers and how we improve all the framework conditions and all the possibilities that could be given for more open and free movement of researchers in Europe. And we have the proposal to establish a pact which is going to be a non-legislative initiative, but it will be a document which aims to put in place and to reach an agreement among the member states, but also the stakeholders on the principles and values for research and innovation in Europe. Yesterday, we had the ministerial conference in Bonn, and uh, uh, sorry, that on Tuesday, and one of the most important deliverables of this ministerial conference was a signature of all member states on a declaration of academic freedom. This could be seen as a first step on putting in place the Pact for Research and Innovation. Uh, please go to the next slide. And I don't want to stay a lot in the next slide because I think 
I said all about that, but I would like to move then to the last slide of my presentation, which is mainly what we plan to do for the researcher's career in the context of this new European research area. So researcher's career, as I said, has been always one of the most important aspects of our collaboration in the context of research of European research area together with the member states and uh, the stakeholders. Uh, there have been a lot of efforts towards increasing access to talent, supporting mobility of researchers, both at re cross-regional and cross-sectorial uh, level. We are actually working to increase awareness, strengthen complementarity, and reinforce through Horizon Europe the support provided by Maris Kotoska Curie, Erasmus Plus, and other initiatives at European, national, and regional level. The aim of a new initiative that we are putting in place in the context of the European research area, the Era for You Policy Initiative, is to enable, first of all, a geographically more balanced circulation of research and innovation talents, strengthening, retaining, attracting, and retrain activities through favorable working conditions, and better access to mobility funding programs. This is one of the main aspects that we are going to address through this new policy initiative. Second aspect is whether and how we will be able in collaboration with the member states and in collaboration also with our stakeholders to boost permeability and employability of research and innovation talents uh, across sectors. And the third point, it's to improve interaction between ecosystem actors for training and career development research infrastructures, universities, research organizations, notably through between academia who train r and talents and future employers that will recruit the highly skilled talents from the business as well. That's one palette of actions that we are proposing. But secondly, we propose a second palette of actions that they are addressing the, uh, the issue of strengthening the careers. In practice, we believe that we need more efforts to ensure common standards for researcher working conditions and to render researchers' careers attractive and sustainable across all EU. What we try to do through the ERA communication is to propose to deliver by the end of 2024 a European research career framework, which is going to be a toolbox of measures from which we expect many particular aspects to be implemented. First of all, to ensure recognition of the competitiveness, research and innovation talents, and to improve interoperability between sectors and contribute to an optimal flow through high skilled, creative and resilient talents. So that's the first objective. Then to update the frameworks of how researchers are rewarded as well as broadening research skill sets. Should it be all about high seated publications and uh, uh, that the researcher's career will be recognized? Today, we had three excellent researchers that they were able in three minutes to convince us that they have the capacity to deliver complex scientific messages to public. Is it and will be one of the main important aspects of the future researcher career and skills, what actually these new researchers managed to, to show us today. And not only that, so how we will be able to connect how quality scientific knowledge and production, open access and data sharing, open collaborative work, societal concerns and engagement and impact, and to boost the recognition of open scholarship. These are aspects that we would like to see in the context of a new uh, prof a careers uh, scheme, a new recognition scheme and a word system for the researchers. And we need to work a lot in this context so that the researchers of today and the researchers of tomorrow, we will be able to have a different kind of career in the academic and the non-academic sector, and they will be able to have a sustainability in their research work. 
The third point is how we achieve more equal treatment in recruitment, promotions, pay, salaries, and access to vocational training, as well as occupational pensions and dismissal. We don't have a common framework in Europe. And each member states, of course, it is a shared responsibility. They have a different approach in these aspects. What we can do to align more and to create a European framework where the member states having their, of course, national uh, uh, responsibility, they will be able to promote the framework conditions for researchers that they are similar or they are, let's say, balanced across Europe. And finally, increase circulation and mobility of RNI human resources worldwide and reinforce the international partnerships for the training of researchers. This is a very important aspect. And then we have to see what type of new arrangements and global partnerships we can do in order to promote the mobility of researchers worldwide and to increase it more. And then, of course, to diffuse the knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to, to say that implementing the new European research area is not something that will happen alone in uh, Brussels offices. It's not something that will happen alone in the member states' capitals or together with Brussels offices. It can only happen if we have an active involvement of all stakeholders, universities, research organizations, research infrastructures, and the researchers and the business. So communicating about the new European research area priorities is very important for us and should not happen only by us. It should happen also by all of you. It should happen also by the stakeholders. And we are looking forward in the context of the future collaboration to be established, a very close collaboration with all of you so that this new European research area will be indeed an open single market for research and innovation in Europe that matters for you, that matters for researchers, and it is a new era that it is for you. Thank you very much. Happy to receive any questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Anna, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, I would maybe start by saying uh, that the, the Coimbra Group welcomes uh, all uh, these initiatives that are really pushing for a strengthening of the human capital, because this is indeed probably the most precious things that we should uh, put forward, especially in the current times. Um, also, we very well uh, uh, appreciated the uh, the very recent Bonn uh, declaration on academic freedom. As you said, this is absolutely uh, central in the in this, this whole system. And Kramer Group has actually uh, the academic freedom as one of its uh, core values uh, as well. And maybe I, I would like also to 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 welcome all the initiatives that are going to really promote uh, a full recognition of the research profession as a real profession, because it is. Uh, I would like to, to maybe just briefly give the floor to Gunda about, uh, 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 let's say, one question, because we are a bit behind schedule. So maybe, Gunda, you can uh, raise one of the questions, and, and uh, we will proceed then to the next part of the agenda. Thank you so much, also from my side. It was a very clear and precise presentation, and I think it didn't leave that much room for questions anyway, so at least not for the moment. Right now, we have only one question which came up in the chat, which I uh, would like to uh, address to you at this point. It's um, about uh, how does the EU avoid excessive administrative burden cost when implementing all those policies? Uh, the reasoning is that already now an EU application is very complex, as is the reporting. This has been the only question rather on the administrative burden going along with it. Um, is there any... Uh, are there any plans to to keep that on a also pragmatic innovative way for the future or is it not really uh, any a topic that you have been talking about in the commission so far so if i understood well good the question goes more in the context of framework program and applications under the framework program is that correct 
that's basically what what I think it's uh, all those measures that you mentioned, also the implementation measure yeah. that you and the action that you plan on implementing to proceed with the priorities that you set okay. in this agenda. I, I suppose it's more linked uh, to the reporting and to the application to the framework program. So that's my understanding. And of course, there will be many initiatives as part of the framework program and also Erasmus and Maris Kodoska Curie that we will try to put in place in order to implement uh, uh, some of the measures. Um, yes, look, first of all, I would like to say that over the last years, we have made an extreme effort in the context of the European Commission to reduce administrative burden and to simplify all the aspects of application, selection and reporting uh, and in the context of Horizon Europe programs. Um, so, uh, from our side, uh, we thought uh, and we still believe that it was a big simplification, but in the context of the next framework program, we also try to put uh, further simplification measures and a full electronic uh, suite of tools in order to be able to reduce the burden uh, to the researchers, because what matters is indeed not to spend time on administrative burden, but more to spend uh, time on doing the research. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, in the next framework period, we would like to see how we reduce uh, the burden on administrative information that needs to be provided by the researchers. Nevertheless, on the other side, we will pay more attention on being able to report on the expected impact and on the uh, expected results and what they are going to bring uh, as benefits for the European Union. So the EU added value and the impact of the projects are going to be more and more the issues that we would request to have more important on that. In the context of administration and application, we will try to simplify as much as we, we can by reducing uh, the, the size of the proposals, uh, by making it more clear, easier to be understandable, and by having a single uh, portal for all programs, uh, including Erasmus, including Horizon Europe, where the uh, beneficiaries, they could eventually have information about potential application. Now, because the new policy initiatives under ERA, uh, they have uh, put in place uh, a monitoring obligations and reporting obligations on how, if all these initiatives will be implemented. If the question is in this context, for example, how we will be able to monitor all this and whether that will imply administrative or reporting obligations from the benefits from the uh, researchers from the member states uh, from the research community if the question goes in this direction i would like to say that our intention is not to you uh, to develop new administrative burden to research and innovation community, but we would like to streamline activities that we already have in place. For example, we want to put in place a platform where we are going to collect research and innovation data with a less burden way through artificial intelligence or through by pulling data coming from different sources together in order to be able through our work to monitoring the implementation of the measures that we have put in place in the context of the European research area, including the mobility of researchers. So I hope that I replied to the question if I understood it well. I certainly believe that you did. So, uh, well, was a uh, we, we could probably talk, uh, go on with the discussion for my, many longer, but uh, we shouldn't forget that we are running out of time and that there's still an open decision and that the tension is probably rising. So from my side, I wouldn't want to ask any further questions. Um, Ludovic, uh, do you want to take over once again? Please. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I would like to thank you very much, Anna, for, for having accepted to be with us today. We will surely continue this discussion on many other occasions. And I think that indeed our three finalists are eager to know, and we are all eager to know what will be the, the final result. So please, Gunda, please proceed. Okay, also, once again, thank you from my side to Anna Panagopoulou. Um, we will now, before suspense is killing us, we will now stop talking um, and I will just hand over to our spokesperson of the jury, which is Rita Piqueux. Thank you, Gunda. And 
thank you, our three excellent finalists for the presentations. It must have been very exciting, but you managed well and, and, and you can imagine how difficult it was for the jury to decide. But anyway, the jury has made uh, the decision. Now it should have some drumming here <laughs> of fanfare. So the third prize goes to Vicente Artola. Congratulations. And the second prize goes to Serena Bruns. Congratulations. So the winner of the Coimbra Group Three Minute Thesis of 2020 is Maria Francesca Di Filippo from the University of Bologna. You all had very many strengths, but, but maybe the balance was best in Maria Francesca's presentation and, and that's why we wanted to award the first prize to, to Maria Francesca. So, in the, at the beginning that, that this is an important, a really important research topic, not only for science, but for the whole world. It's interesting and we want to know more about your topic. So you started very well and you spent your three minutes in a very perfect way. The introduction was not too long. It was inspiring, but short. And you used most of the time for the research itself and its results and its impact. Not only for science, but also for the society and, and for ordinary people. Your slide was very informative. It was uh, maybe the most detailed of these three slides, but not too <laughs> detailed. So it enhanced and it supported your presentation, but it didn't steal the attention from you. Your way of presenting was excellent. The language you used was very appropriate. Also to non-specialist audience, you used some terminology, but I think it was necessary for your topic. So you shouldn't trivialize on the other hand. So it was maybe most terminology of these three presentations, but anyway, it was necessary to, to have this terminology. So from the point of view of the jury, the, the balance between science, between research and communication was the best in your presentation. So congratulations, excellent science communication. I hope that you have learned a lot during this process and, and you can use it in your future career. Thank you, Rita. Thank you to the jury. Um, that was also a very, very uh, good explanation and how you finally came up to really um, nominate a winner among all these three excellent presentations. I'd like to thank all of you once again, Vicente, Selina and Maria. Congratulations. Congratulations to all of you for your fantastic presentation. Um, I wish you all the best for your future and also for finishing your PhD and to continue on your exciting research topics. Well, we will now, now officially close the three-minute thesis final of the Coimbra Group uh, 2020 edition. It has been a pleasure to listen to all of you. I will say goodbye now. Thank you once again to everyone. And I will give the floor to Ludovic Tilly for the last part of this session, which will be then the uh, presentation of the Arenberg Prize. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I would like just before uh, congratulating, I would like to recall the audience that uh, the, the session is not over. We still have a prize to deliver and uh, we will uh, go to this uh, very quickly. But before that, I would like to really warmly congratulate uh, the, the three finalists and of course, uh, a special mention to Maria Francesca, uh, but also Selina and Vicente, you did a really wonderful job. You were the ambassadors of the Coimbra Group today and, and I am delighted that you, 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 you all deserve these, these prizes. And I would like to second Rita's and good as comment on, on the ability that you have uh, shown today. Uh, this is really wonderful and I wish you the best for your future.
And without waiting, I would like to now move to the last part of this uh, session today, that is uh, uh, the um, ceremony related to the uh, now famous Arambert Klimba Group Prize for uh, Erasmus students. This is actually a prize which has been launched uh, 14 years ago, uh, so this is a, a recurring, a very important event in the, the Quimba Group's life. Um, the, um, we have today uh, the, the, the two uh, most important actors for this ceremony, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, His Highness the Duke of Aremberg, who is with us today. He will give a, a speech related to the, the whole meaning of this prize in collaboration with the Quimba Group, and of course we have uh, the the, um, the laureate of this uh, of this uh, prize, and this is Madalena Santani, who is also with us. But before just uh, giving them the, the floor, I would like to just give a few interesting facts about this prize, which uh, is, uh, as I said, is the, the uh, its 14th edition. Uh, if we look at the the past 14 years. Uh, it is very interesting to see that the profiles of the applicants uh, actually covered more than half of the, the whole Quimba Group universities, uh, and uh, also 80% of the Quimba Group members at universities are concerned as host universities for the Erasmus exchange period of the applicants. And of course, I should re recall that the whole meaning of this prize is actually to recognize an Erasmus uh, mobility in the context of the Coimbra Group and also related to the specific topics supported by the uh, Aranda Foundation. So without uh, waiting, I would like to uh, now give the floor to His Highness the Duke of Harenberg. So please, it's up to you and, and over to you. Hello? Yes, Hello? We, we do hear you. Yes. We, we do not see you, however. Yeah, so I have to try to make it happen. Video. So, ladies and gentlemen, directors, professors, and students of the Ironburg. Uh, group of, of the Coringa Group, dear representatives of the European Commission, Mesdames et Messieurs, meine Damen und Herren, thank you for being with us today as we are awarding the 2020 Ironburg Coringa Group Prize, which recognizes the academic value of the Erasmus student exchanges. 2020 is a very special year for all of us, and I believe that this pandemic has taught us already two important lessons. First, we are not the masters of the universe and we are learning once more what the word humility really means. Second, we become more aware that nothing replaces the personal contact between human beings. And I'm sure that our senior citizens who are deprived of family visits and our students who can't experience the joys of campus life are going to agree with me. If we look back at time, we realize that everything is possible, that nothing is ever granted, that life is a never ending movement for the better or for the worse. Nevertheless, so far humanity has successfully overcome the deadliest pandemics. We are going to survive this one as well, with all of us hoping that we're going to learn something out of this and do things differently in the future. Our Ironberg Hormer Group Prize for Erasmus students has been awarded every year since 2007, the first time being in Turku, Finland, almost 15 years ago, and much before any other international recognition of Erasmus activities. This reveals the great importance that both the Ironberg Foundation and the Coimbra Group place in the physical mobility of students and researchers within Europe. We hear a lot about virtual mobility while knowing in the deepest of ourselves that nothing replaces the face-to-face -face contact, the shortest distance between two people being a smile. This shall encourage us to advocate and act even more towards enhancing and promoting the circulations of the circulation of students and researchers within Europe. 
la Fondation d'Arembert fait la promotion de l'histoire de la culture dans un esprit résolument européen à partir de la ville belge d'Anguin, Edige in het Nederlands. Nous mettons un grand fonds d'archives familiales à disposition des chercheurs qui viennent de toute l'Europe. Nous organisons des concerts, des conférences, des séminaires, des rallyes automobiles culturelles. Nous organisons ou participons à des expositions, comme par exemple celle qui se déroule en ce moment à la bibliothèque de l'Arsenal à Paris, à l'occasion du bicentenaire de la Société des bibliophiles François. Nous attribuons différents prix, à savoir deux prix d'histoire tous les deux ans, Ensuite, le prix Arambert Coimbra Group, qui encourage la mobilité étudiantine entre les universités européennes du Coimbra Group dans le cadre du programme Erasmus. Et enfin, le prix, le prix Collège de l'Europe Arambert, par lequel nous récompensons des travaux qui étudient les mécanismes permettant aux peuples de vivre ensemble, à la fois dans, un vrai, euh, à la fois dans le vrai respect de leurs différences et dans un esprit d'union européenne. Nous publions ou contribuons également à publier des livres, plus d'une trentaine à ce jour. Cette année, nous avons publié quatre ouvrages, soit un ouvrage sur la famille d'Arambert en Autriche, Bohème, Moravie et Italie du Nord, un ouvrage sur les caregivers, ces personnes très dévouées qui aident les vestiges de guerre américains à se réinsérer dans la vie civile, un ouvrage sur la résistance armée en Europe de l'Est entre 1944 et 1956, euh, à l'époque de l'Union soviétique, et enfin un quatrième livre intitulé « Allemagne et France au cœur du Moyen-Âge » et publié en collaboration avec l'Institut de France et l'Institut historique allemand à Paris. Ce livre s'attache à décrire la notion de frontière entre les parties de l'Empire carolingien qui deviendront l'Allemagne et la France. « Wir gratulieren Sie herzlich den Professor und Dominique Barthélemy und Rolf Groß, die es geschafft haben » anhand außergewöhnlichen Urkunden dieses ehrgeizige Projekt in kurzer Zeit zu einem guten Ende zu bringen. Si nous nous donnons autant de peine pour contribuer très modestement à faire l'Europe d'en bas celle des citoyens, c'est avec l'idée de contribuer à leur réapprendre, à penser par eux-mêmes, à penser lentement, à penser dans le long terme et à penser à nouveau en termes de géopolitique. Je ne peux m'empêcher ici de lancer un vibrant hommage à ce jeune professeur français d'histoire-géographie Samuel Paty, lâchement décapité le 16 octobre dernier par un fanatique religieux, tout simplement parce qu'il s'efforçait d'ouvrir le monde à la jeunesse. Let's talk now about the students and researchers of the day about Madalena Centani, our laureate 2020. She first got a Bachelor of Science degree with summa cum laude from the Amsterdam University College in 2016. Thereafter, she successfully completed cum laude a Master of Science in Biopharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Leiden with a six-month exchange period in Sweden at Uppsala University in 2018. And since February this year, she has been pursuing a PhD in Clinical Pharmacology at the University of Uppsala as a direct result from her Erasmus experience. The topic of her PhD is about a model-based development of dosing strategies for improved cancer treatment, a disease everybody wants to get rid of. She's the 14th laureate of the Arenberg Rima Group Prize and our second laureate from Leiden University. We warmly congratulate Madalena Centani for her achievements and wish her a long career in successfully fighting cancer and other diseases for the benefit of all of us. The prize, this prize is an annual award open to all master degree candidates at the Coimbra Group University who have previously undertaken an Erasmus exchange with another Coimbra Group University in any discipline. The prize distinguishes the student who best demonstrates the added value of the Erasmus exchange to his or her master degree work. And today I, will, I would like to encourage all eligible candidates to apply as we are launching already the 2021 edition. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Highness, for your very inspiring speech. I would like to say maybe just a few personal words because I was uh, uh, personally uh, very much uh, sensitive to uh, the fact that you recall uh, how much uh, physical mobility is something that we should continue to, to aim at. We hope indeed that uh, the, this uh, COVID-19 crisis will be 
soon uh, something that we go over and that we can all resume and meet physically all together. And of course, I, I very much appreciated your tribute to the French teacher who got assassinated very recently uh, fighting for the freedom of speech. Thank you very much for this tribute. Uh, this is uh, highly valued. And you did an excellent job as well in presenting our laureate of today. So without waiting, I would like to give the floor to Madalena. Please, Madalena. Thank you. I hope my microphone is working. Yes. I do feel very fortunate to stand in front of you today, or I should say rather sit in front of you today. Um, it means a lot to me that my research project was selected for this year's prize, and I would like to thank the Duke of Ironberg, the Executive Board, and the Selection Committee for the honor of receiving this prize. Under normal circumstances, we would have all met in person, but due to the current situation, this is unfortunately not possible. We are living in strange times, and I'm sure that we have all had to make great sacrifices, both in work and personal lives, in order to ensure that we remain safe, our families remain safe, and our communities remain safe. I believe now more than ever, we are aware of the strength of the healthcare system, but also the difficult choices that sometimes need to be made when it comes to healthcare decisions. And this in a way relates back to my research where I attempt to find the perfect balance between drug efficacy and drug safety in order to support the patient's journey back to health. With that being said, I would like to express my gratitude to everyone that has supported me in my educational journey the University of Amsterdam, the University of Leiden, and the University of Uppsala for supporting and inspiring me throughout all the years in academia. I would also like to thank everyone involved in the Erasmus program, which has allowed me to visit another university during my studies and has finally resulted in the completion of my research project that I finished today. I do believe that continuous interaction between institutions and disciplines is crucial in order to tackle the many complex issues that we're currently facing the corona pandemic being one of these problems, and programs like Erasmus truly help young individuals to achieve such interactions. So finally, to conclude, although it is crucial to remain conscious of the current corona situation, I do really hope that in the future, it will be more feasible to have international exchange again, and that the students that will come after me will be able to visit other universities and extend their knowledge by interacting with other academic and disciplinary fields. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madalena. I would like to personally uh, uh, congratulate uh, you for this prize, which were, was highly deserved. There was actually a coincidence also that the research field that you are working on and uh, um, is also related to uh, the, the, the current uh, sanitary situation in a way. And uh, we thought that it was even more appropriate uh, to, uh, to, uh, that you receive this prize uh, this year. Uh, uh, we know that uh, also you have been personally involved in the, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so uh, really it's, uh, let's say a double congratulation and, and highly deserved prize uh, for, for you this year. So we wish you the best for the future of your research. And uh, we, we hope that you will also give us some news about the, the, the success in your research in the, in the very near future. Thank you, thank you, Madalena. I would also, I would also like you, you, you hear me, right? Yes. Um, uh, I would like also to, to thank uh, the Duke of Arenberg for uh, uh, the, uh, the continued support over the years. Uh, we will continue to work together on uh, this uh, prize and, and potentially future evolutions, but uh, uh, we would like to uh, once again uh, thank you for, for your continued support. And finally, before closing, I would like to also have a a special attention to our colleagues in Montpellier, because as it was said on many occasions, uh, in, in principle, we should have been uh, doing this uh, three minute uh, final, uh, thesis final uh, in Montpellier last June, and also uh, the ceremony for the Quimber Group Arundac Prize also in, in June uh, in Montpellier. And unfortunately, we could not all meet physically. And even uh, the, the, the session of today was uh, for some time uh, plan to be physically in Montpellier, but uh, it was finally not possible. So special thoughts to our colleagues in Montpellier uh, who uh, could not uh, welcome us. And uh, finally, I would like to thank all the organizers today, the technical staff, the colleagues from Canada, all the colleagues who have uh, worked uh, all together to prepare the session, the jury, Gunda, the colleagues at the office. Thank you all, and we wish you all the best and we hope to see you physically soon, as, as soon as possible. Thank you all and good luck.